So we are going to talk today about gender and early childhood development. And before we get into that, let me just give a brief uh, overview of Las Cumbres. Our organization began its services in Los Alamos County 50 years ago. We currently provide a wide range of services for families in Santa Fe, Rio Riba, Taos, and Los Alamos. You can check out our website and the services we offer in each community. All services are free of charge. Thanks to a grant from Los Alamos County, we have expanded our services in Los Alamos. Um, we now actually have an office location there, which is nice. Uh, my name is Max Street, which is so cute. Sorry, yes. I, just, I always nugget. have to plug that. <laughs> yes, on Nugget Street. Um, my name is Max Darling, and I am um, a developmental specialist and family service coordinator for our family infant toddler program at Las Cumbres. I primarily work in Santa Fe County. Occasionally, I have families in Rio Riba and Los Alamos, and I use pronouns they, them, which we'll get into a little bit later about what that might mean for those of us who aren't sure. And I love um, my field of work because I, I truly enjoy getting to see children flourish and getting to see the relief and pride that parents have for their parents, um, for their parents, for their children, when they see their parent, their children grow and reach developmental milestones, um, just getting to see the, the true joy from that is just really rewarding to me. And then my co presenter is Jess Brennan. Hi, I'm Jess Brennan. I also use the pronouns they them. And I am a behavioral health therapist with Las Cumbres. Um, also primarily in Santa Fe County, but I do also work in Rio Arriba, sometimes Los Alamos. Um, and I really love what I do because families come in to see us for so many different reasons. Uh, maybe we're helping them recover from a traumatic event or a lifetime of traumatic events, or maybe we're just trying to help parents and children see each other for who they really are. And that's something that I get to support in my role. And I feel incredibly honored and privileged to do that. So our discussion topic for today is what if my son loves dolls? Um, and we're going to be exploring how the gender roles that are so common in our society can have a pretty significant impact on children's development. And the reason I came up with the idea of doing this discussion topic and brought Max in because um, Max is also very passionate about these issues is that I get asked this question quite a lot in my work as a behavioral health therapist. Kids will come in for play therapy and sometimes a little boy will pick up a doll and the parents just kind of have this look of panic and they kind of look to me sometimes for permission. Is it okay that he does this? And, you know, I'll have my little speech that I'll give about it and thought, wouldn't it be great if we could open this up into a bigger discussion? So um, I'm gonna pop up a little image here. So you let your son play with dolls. Aren't you afraid he'll turn out to be a good father? So this is a response that we see a lot when parents ask this kind of question. And on one hand, completely true. There's no link between what toys children choose to play with when they're young and the people they grow up to be. And also that's a really oversimplifying way to talk about this because the implication in that image is that it's okay. It doesn't mean that he's going to be gay when really, if a child does grow up to be gay or trans or anywhere else in the LGBTQ plus spectrum, that's completely okay. And also there's no correlation. So what we wanna do with this workshop is to be able to support both. So how do we understand how the gender roles that show up in development affect all children and how a more inclusive approach can benefit all children. And also, if a child does come out as being somewhere in the LGBTQ plus um, spectrum, how do we help them? How do we support them? 
And we want to try to cover both of those questions in this workshop because both are completely valid questions. So, um, Max, I know that you have a lot of really great information about things that you see on the early intervention side of things. And I would love to start there. Sure. So just to start off, there are some developmental milestones that children reach. And I've just noticed certain patterns based on a child's gender that are more common with girls versus boys. Um, for example, transitional objects which are objects that children attach to typically um, around the age of like a year to two years. Um, they will attach to like a little teddy bear or like a doll or a blanket or whatever is significant for them. That's something that they feel is comforting when they go to a different place. Um, it's called transitional because it's when they're transitioning to another place, it provides a source of comfort, reminds them of home or their parents or loved ones. Um, sometimes it'll like have a shirt, like a little stuffed animal will have a shirt of like a parent they love, it smells like them. Um, and these are really self-soothing objects for children to use to help calm them so that they're not always relying on other people to regulate and they start to develop a sense of self psych um, psychologically at that age. And I have noticed a trend that this um, these objects are more commonly used by girls. Um, I have noticed that girls tend to form these attachments because at a very young age, they're conditioned to play pretend with dolls or um, anything that's um, like a kitchen set, anything that has to do with like life skills, um, showing a baby how to be fed, how to be, how to change its diaper, things like that. And I think because of that, they have this um, attachment of like wanting to hug a baby, wanting to carry it around, wanting to um, be nurturing. And I think that boys don't often get that opportunity. They're not given dolls. They sometimes they are, but not you know not as commonly as girls. Um, they're not as often given like a kitchen set, though I have seen that change um, over the course of the past couple of years. And I think that also with little boys, when they show emotions, I think they're told to just stop and to stop. And then the parents um, often are saying, well, I don't wanna baby him. But um, with girls, I have noticed emotionally, they tend to have stronger social emotional skills as a result because they're allowed to show some feelings because we expect we have these gender biases that girls are supposed to be very emotional and very sensitive. And so because of that, I think we expect girls to show emotions a little more. But with boys, we tell them, oh, well, don't be like a girl or don't be like a sissy, which is offensive to say, um, but we teach that to kids. It's very normalized. It's not just parents, it's in our society, right? It's ingrained in the way that we view gender, the way we view each other. Um, and so I do think that because of that, I've noticed some trends with development and I think boys tend to have stronger gross motor skills. Um, so large muscle development, um, balancing, strength, coordination, all of that seems to be stronger. And I wonder sometimes how much of it is them actually being biologically male versus how much parents are conditioning them to have more opportunities mm -hmm. to use their strength and practice those muscles. Um, and I'll let yeah, Jen get can. into that. Sorry, yeah. I was just gonna say, if I could just jump in for a second there. Absolutely. Uh, there's actually a lot of research that has been done, um, even going back several decades, that if you hand a newborn to somebody who's never met the newborn before, and you tell them, this is a boy versus this is a girl, the way they hold the child is different. We mm -hmm. tend to be more gentle with girls. We tend to play rougher with boys. And it depends more on whether we are told the child is a girl or a boy, um, much more so than what um, sex the child has actually been assigned. And some of this research has shown that from this very early age, just the way that we're holding kids, the way that we're playing with them, the ways that we're expecting them to move can have such a profound effect on how the muscles and the skeleton develop that 
this might actually account for a lot more of the like strength and athletic ability disparities we see between adult men and women than we might have ever thought. So it's interesting to think what potential might the, all of these little girls have that we're denying them by treating them differently as little babies. Yeah, and just to add a personal experience, um, and we'll get into more about uh, gender and the different nuances of, of it in a minute. Um, but I just wanted to share from my childhood, as somebody who um, identifies as non-binary and transmasculine, I was um, assigned female at birth, and I was expected to grow out of the phase of being what people called a tomboy, because they assumed that about me. Uh, I was very athletic, very much into sports, and people assumed it was a phase in my family. Um, because if, if I were seen as a little boy, I don't think it would have been seen as a phase. And I also think as I got older, some of my skills, my athleticism kind of dropped off because I didn't have the support of like my family helping me practice these skills um, because they didn't, they acted like it was just temporary. Oh, you're just temporarily involved in this, like these sports, you'll, you'll, you'll grow out of it. They wanted me to, you know, read more books. They wanted me to be more interested in dolls. Um, I would ask for ask action figures. I'd be given dolls, things like that. And I played with a variety of toys. I was very lucky. But I got to do that and my when I had my brother he got to play with more action figures I would like play with him and so I got to have the best of both worlds in certain ways but um <laughs> my parents definitely made assumptions about what toys I would like to play with and what activities I wanted to do based on my gender um and so that definitely limited me and um, I did lose some of my athleticism um as I got older because I wasn't given the opportunity to really practice those skills I really loved as a child, as a young child. Um, and so that, I just wanted to share that. And Jess, did you want to get into the LGBTQ plus the gender gender terms that we were going to talk about? Yes, in just a moment. Um, I also wanted to mention while these um, gender expectations that we're putting on kids can really impact girls in the realm of their gross motor development. In boys, we really see they, they're not developing as much in terms of how to express their emotions because that's just not something that we expect of boys and men. And then when they get to school age, I end up seeing them because they're being aggressive with their peers because they mm -hmm. haven't been taught any other ways to be in the world. Mm -hmm. When we look at the toys that kids are expected to play with based on gender. We're giving boys toys that are aggressive, which again, there's nothing like inherently wrong with that. There's a time and place for them, um, but we're giving them toys for aggression. We're giving them toys to help them learn things like cause and effect. We're giving them toys to build these rich imaginary worlds with superheroes and um, all kinds of action figures and giving them toys about jobs that they might have in the future, like construction. And all of that is great. And then we're giving girls toys that teach them life skills, like a doll might teach them to take care of a baby someday. A kitchen set might teach them how to you perform all of the tasks that adults would perform in the kitchen, cooking for themselves, cleaning. These are the things that we expect of girls. And when we think about it, we all need all of these skills. So why are we limiting them based on gender? It doesn't make any sense. And so then um, when I'm seeing kids who are a little bit older, I'm seeing a lot of boys who were never taught to express their emotions and only know how to do it through aggression. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing a lot of little girls who don't know how to set boundaries for themselves, who um, maybe are lacking some of that confidence because they haven't had the chance to really engage with activities like um, with sports and with toys that can help them build mastery over things. We see a lot of girls 
being missed for diagnoses such as ADHD and autism spectrum because we just don't expect little girls to have these kinds of problems, or not problems, but um, needs for support. And Another so, thing, oh, sorry. I was just gonna say that we're missing a lot of opportunities to support these kids because we're expecting them to fit into a gender box perfectly and no one does. Yep. And I was just gonna add to that as well that um, I have noticed as well that fine motor skills or small muscle development and hand-eye coordination, mm -hmm. hand dexterity. I have noticed that they're most commonly boys struggle with those skills because they're expected to be moving around and not have the attention span or the stillness in their bodies to be able to sit and do stationary tabletop activities. And I've seen a lot of parents say, oh, he'll, he'll do it later. He's just too busy moving around. And while that may be true when a child's a new walker because they have a whole new world open up once they can do that skill, um, that may be true a little bit after a child's a year. Um, however, when they're two to three and they're not drawing and they're about to go to preschool and they can't even draw with like an adult grasp, um, they, don't, they won't be able to do some of the activities in preschool. And usually children then will thrive once they're around peers their age and can see things modeled for them. Um, however, I think that I have seen a lot of parents, um, like with little boys, they don't get those, they don't get to master those skills. Uh, um, and also if they're late talkers, I've seen a lot, well, he'll talk when he's ready, you know, he, and there's a lot of defensiveness around boys not doing certain skills. Um, and sometimes I wonder if we see some delays in young, in young boys because um, there's a bit of a disconnect, like, oh, well, he'll learn it later. He's too busy doing this. Whereas girls, we kind of, we expect more of them. We expect them to be developmentally more advanced. We expect them to have pre-educational skills earlier. Like you expect girls to sit down and color and look at books and play with dolls. And I know this sounds all like really, really, really big generalizations that I'm making, um, but that those kinds of gender stereotypes I've seen in patterns um, over and over again. And some parents don't do that as much as others. Um, but it is something that we see a lot in our society and it's normalized. Um, and then I do want to make sure we have time to talk a little bit about gender um, since we have about 15 yes. minutes before we get into questions. Yes. So one of the wonderful things that can happen when kids come in for play therapy is that all of the toys are available to all of the kids. And we see them reach for things that they may have never had the opportunity to play with before. And it can be a really wonderful experience for them. And this is really what we're advocating for is to really look at where are these boxes limiting for kids and what might be some ways that I can help them step out of this and support their whole development. And so we also want to talk about what if a child does express um, being something other than straight and cisgender, and we will get to, um, we're not going to go into all of the vocabulary terms. Um, I highly recommend if you want the full overview of that to um, look into a Trans 101 training Obviously, we don't have the time to do all of that and cover our other topics in just, um, I mean, it really ends up being about 40 minutes, but we're just going to give you some basic terms so that you can follow along. Um, Max, would you like to start with some terms? Sure. Um, so non-binary specifically as just as i introduced myself as being non-binary it means that you're outside of the gender binary of male and female um, and gender a lot of people think gender and sex are the same thing but they're actually not synonymous gender actually means how you identify in your identity versus sex is like biologically um what what you are based on you know based on you know, certain body parts based on chromosomes, which 
let's be real, a lot of us don't know what chromosomes we actually have. So if you say you know that you're a woman or you know that you're a man, how do you actually know what your chromosomes are? Just just saying mm -hmm. here. Um, also, transgender is an umbrella term, as is non-binary, and transgender just means that you're not the gender you were assigned at birth. Um, not every non-binary person um, identifies as trans. I do, uh, because I feel like I'm more on the masculine side. Um, transmasculine is another umbrella term. I do not identify as a trans man, but I fit more under the masculine side of gender, uh, but not entirely i feel like my gender is a little bit more fluid which is why i use non-binary trans masculine uh, mm -hmm. to cover all my bases um and uh trans trans um transgender just means that you're either transitioning to a different gender or your gender falls out of the category you were assigned at birth so transgender person could be transitioning to the opposite gender they could be somewhere in between they could be a gender um and not meaning have any that they don't identify with the concept of gender at all yep mm -hmm. there are many and different use, terms yeah i used the term cisgender a little while ago that simply just means that you do identify with the um your gender is the same as the sex you were assigned at birth so someone is born doctor says it's a girl they grow up they identify as a woman that's all cisgender means so this would be a great time. I have a little graphic here um, that can help us understand a little bit more about some of these topics. We have the gender unicorn. So what I really like about this graphic here is that it um, it separates out all of these different aspects of identity so that we can really see that these are all separate things. So somebody, um, if for example, I were to put, make my own gender unicorn, I'm trying to think of how one would phrase that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but on, in terms of identity, um, I would say I'm somewhere in the non-binary realm, um, maybe a little bit of everything. My gender expression tends to be more feminine just because of these are, those are the things that I feel the most comfortable wearing, um, which a lot of times tends to mean that the fact that my internal gender identity is a little bit more masculine tends to be invisible. Um, I'm assigned female at birth. And then as far as attraction, I'm typically drawn to people who are women or other. <laughs> um, somewhere on that end of things. Um, so we can see by looking at the gender unicorn, these things are all separate. Um, a lot of times when we're talking about kids, people start to get really uncomfortable. Like, why are we sexualizing children? Which, hold on, um, it's not sexualizing children to affirm their gender identity because sexual orientation, gender identity, two completely different things. Gender identity is who you are sexual orientation is who you love, two different things. So I'm gonna take this off the screen now so we can all see each other again. Um, so we tend to only get really concerned about, oh, they're, they're too young to know, they're too young to think about these things when we're talking about kids being something other than straight and cisgender. Mm -hmm. Like we, we can have onesies that say he's a ladies man and that's fine. But if an elementary school child says, you know, I think I have a crush on somebody and they happen to be the same sex. Whoa, <laughs> they can't be thinking about this yet. Mm -hmm. When like, kids having crushes is so normal. And you ask a straight person 
about their childhood how they know how did you know you were straight they say oh i was seven years old i had a crush on the opposite gender or opposite sex um depending on how you look at the terms and they just know you know and it's funny because we we doubt kids who say that when they're young as if they don't know when we do we can sense these things at a young age and also like before you've gone through puberty like it's natural to still have like emotional crushes on people um that's mm -hmm. very common and even children i mean there um there's research that you were talking about just with me earlier if you want to share about children yes. declaring gender at a young age too so the american academy of pediatrics has come out and said that while not all kids know this early it's actually really common for kids to have a pretty firm idea of what their gender is by age four. So we're talking really young and remember what their gender is versus sexual orientation to completely different things. We're talking about they have a firm idea of who they are. I'm a boy, I'm a girl, I'm something else by around four years old. And I think that it's wonderful now that this vocabulary is out in the mainstream as much as it is. So kids have words to describe it. I know that um, for myself, as a little kid, I, I just knew that I was different. I knew that all my friends had crushes on boys and I had no concept of like, what is this? What is this supposed to feel like? Maybe we could be friends, is that what this is? Because I didn't feel that and I didn't know that there were any other options. And I knew that whenever I played imaginary games with friends, I was always totally fine with being the boy character. And I didn't know that there were options other than well, I'm a girl, but I don't always feel like one. And now kids know that they have options and they don't have to go through the same amount of confusion, which I think is just wonderful. Exactly. And it's about just giving children opportunities to explore. Uh, it's not about saying, oh, I, I'm going to make sure my kid's trans. Like people often think no. when we're being supportive of children that we're going to turn them gay or turn them trans. No, it's about creating a safe space where they can be who they are as they are. Because the bottom line is, if a child ends up being gay or transgender or something like that, um, a parent not supporting them isn't going to change that. It's just going to make them feel very depressed, very alienated. And honestly, and I don't mean to get like, you know, really sad and morbid here, but it can incre increase the chance of that child being suicidal. Yes. And so it's really important to give children opportunities where they can feel like they, who they are is embraced and cherished and that they also have room to explore who that person is and feel like they can come home to a safe space and have that be nurtured. Mm -hmm. um, it's really important. So we might not all be able to relate to the experience of not feeling supported by a parent in our gender or our sexuality, but I'm sure most of us can think of an example of a time when something was really important to us or we felt like it was really core to who we were as a person. And somebody, especially a parent, just didn't get it. Maybe even wish that we were different in some way and how awful that feels. And then think about that feeling only it's about something as core to you, who you are as your gender or who you're going to grow up and fall in love with. And we can really see how this can be so damaging to a child's mental health. Um, the Trevor Project, um, it's a really wonderful resource for supporting LGBTQ plus youth, um, has come out with a statistic that having one supportive adult at home can decrease the risk of suicide attempts in LGBTQ youth by 40%. 
which is huge. And I know that anybody who has a child, whether or not that child identifies as LGBTQ, that's what we want. We want our kids to be happy. I mean, heaven forbid, no parent wants to ever know that their child is feeling like they want to end their own life. But how do we do this? How do we be a supportive parent, especially as kids are going through this process of self-discovery? And how are we advocating for those things so that our children are also treating their peers respectfully and not mm -hmm. bullying them for being LGBTQIA plus or having an unsafe household where your where your child's friends are coming over and they might be gay or trans and it's not an inclusive supportive space. That's also yes. something to consider. That's a wonderful point, Max, and that's why this is really important information for all parents to have, not just parents who have had a child come out as LGBTQ+. We want our children to go through the world not making other children feel this way. Because when it comes down to it, isn't that what we all want as parents? So I would say the most important thing to being an affirming parent is, I mean, honestly, exactly what I would say to anybody who's looking for to improve their parenting in, other, in any other way. And it's not about being up to date on all of the best terminology and knowing all of the research. I mean, those things are great, but when it comes down to what is really important, it's being able to see your child for who they are right now and to be able to affirm that, to be able to validate that, to be able to follow their lead as they express who they are and to know that it might change. I mean, we all as adults certainly aren't walking around the exact same person we, are, we were at four, at nine, at 13. That would be such an embarrassing world. <laughs> Can we all just take a moment to be relieved that we are not all the same person <laughs> that we were at all of those ages. That a child might express a particular gender identity one day and then the next week say that, you know, I don't think that's actually me. And that's okay. That doesn't make it any less valid this is what they were thinking at the time. And it's all part of the self-discovery process. And because I mean, it's a sense of change, does it mean that we shouldn't, that we should doubt it to begin with? Exactly. Because they might express, this is who I am. And that's, that's it. They knew at a really young age and that's who they are for the rest of their life. They might go through a really long and complex and difficult self-discovery process and identify as several different things along the way to figuring out who they really are. And both of those are equally valid. And when we think about how children discover who they are with any other aspect of identity, both completely normal. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so the most important thing is just to listen and to affirm, say, okay, I see you. And if they ask to be called by a certain name, by a certain pronoun, use it. Use it to the best of your ability. It's okay to slip up. It happens. But just to know that you're making an effort and that you see them is so critically important. Wonderful question. Um, I think as much as this probably isn't 
the answer we all want to hear. It's right. important to remember that we can provide information, but we can't always change a parent's mind. Um, we can't change family values. Um, people are going to have different beliefs and that's okay. But we can show up as a supportive, affirming person to that child. Um, and we can keep providing some education about, you know, this doesn't really mean anything about how, who he's going to grow up to be. These are some skills that playing with toys like this can teach. Um, this is the function of playing with dolls, playing with kitchen sets or any other thing that's typically associated with girls. And maybe they change their minds about it, maybe they don't. But at the very least, the child's able to see that this person sees me. If you feel comfortable bringing it up gently again, um, I would say something like if the parent's having another baby or is pregnant or mm -hmm. say they have a relative who's gonna have a baby, like don't you want him to be a supportive brother or cousin? And this teaches him to do that. And this has nothing to do with gender. It just has to do with showing him how to nurture and have that empathy. Um, yeah. So I think pointing that out is also a good a good way to bring it up in a supportive way. Like we want to support him in those skills of of showing that care and that social emotional development, mm -hmm. and right. um, and model some of the skills, the developmental skills for that other child. Um, and in doing so, it'll it'll support everybody. That's a great point, Max, because I I do end up seeing a lot of little boys who have a younger sibling and are really aggressive with that younger sibling because they've never really been taught how to play with something or someone in a gentle way. And mm -hmm. we can bring up, this is a way to teach that skill. This is a way to teach them how to interact with a baby or with someone or something that's delicate, a baby, a puppy, a kitten, whatever the family anticipates <laughs> this child might come into contact with. This is how we can teach him how to be gentle because That's kids need that skill too. And give us some feedback so that we can continue providing these, not we as in Jess and I, but we as an agency can continue these ask, um, ask a specialist workshops for you and that you can give us feedback for how we can improve and how we can do better and what topics you'd like to see in the future. Um, I really enjoyed our time today. Thank you so much for coming. Mm -hmm. And be sure to tune in for the next uh, workshop about going back to school and how that, how we can support kids through that, especially this year when a lot of them haven't been in school for a very long time. All right. Thank you all. Hope you have a very nice weekend. Thanks, Thank everyone. You guys.